it's showtime. Good morning, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am so excited to talk to the next guest. He is one of my favorite people truly in life and in the plant-based movement. And if it wasn't for the movie Forks Over Knives, of which he was one of the stars, I might never have met him. I was blessed to be invited by Brian Wendell to the premiere of Forks Over Knives in Los Angeles in I believe it was 2011. And I was the most excited to meet this person based on what he had said in the movie. You may or may not be familiar with him, but he is just, I love him so much. I don't know what to tell you other than that's the truth. He is from Chicago. He had been a urologist there for many, and he's still a urologist, but that's his professional training as an MD. But to me, he's just a friend and a movie star. He's been in a lot of movies and he is just such a, a, just a wonderful person to have in our community. And his name is Dr. Terry Mason. Welcome. Dr. Mason, I'm so excited to talk oh, to you. Oh, listen, I was just telling, for the benefit of the listeners and watchers, I just want you to know, AJ, you have figured out a way to age backwards. <laughs> like Benjamin Button. Well, people aren't going to believe how old you are. I feel like I'm looking at a man that's maybe 40. They're going to drop over in their yeah. chairs when they see that you're going to be 70 next year. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely correct. But I just thank God for for a great life and I thank him for having me to see and creating situations for me to be in the presence of people like yourself and Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. Campbell and Baxter Montgomery and just a whole host of people, Neil Barnard. Uh, and of course I can't leave out Mike Greger, just, uh, just an, an enormous group of people that have changed my life. Uh, actually, let me put it this way, help me to change my life. Because what the people that are watching, people can't change your life. You have to change your life. And you have to be armed with the right, right information so you can make the best decisions to help you help yourself to be here, not just for a long time, but a healthy time. And we want you to be able to do the things. We want you to be able to live, work, play as long as you want to. And uh, yeah, my story is an interesting, and in my mind, it's an interesting story how I got to this plant-based thing because I was a steak a day eating guy. A steak a day, that's incredible. I want to hear your entire story and I'm going to shut up for most of this interview. But if I could just ask you one question because sure. this is what got me as a huge fan of you. In Forks Over Knives, you had a very memorable line. Do you remember <laughs> that line? If it walks, hops, crawls, swims, <laughs> slithers, got eyes, a mama and a daddy, don't eat it. That's what made me fall in love with you, that line. <laughs> so without further ado, ado, let's hear your story, Dr. Mason, how you went from a steak a day guy to a healthy plant eater that's gonna turn 70 years old that looks absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, it was one of those things where I was a resident in surgery at uh, Michael Reese Hospital, actually in urology, because I'm a urologist by training. I practiced urology for 26 years in the city of Chicago. And then, and I'll tell you the story, I made the transition from back to public health. But I was a steak a day guy. I had the guy cut my porterhouses and my T-bones and at the grocery store, and I picked them up a week's worth at a time. And I ate one every single day. And one day, uh, while I was on a treadmill, I noticed that I started having a little chest pain. And I never had this before. I'm like, what the hell is this? So my, one of my good buddies and the person that I referred a lot of patients to is a cardiologist. And he said, hey man, why don't you just come over to uh, the hospital, let's check you out. So anyway, he says, let me tell you, you already had chest pain on the treadmill. There's no need to do that because you failed that. So what he did is he said, you just bought admission to my cardiac cath lab. So I went and had a car emergent cardiac cath where they stuck a little tube in my groin up into my heart, squirted dye around and found a blockage in my coronary artery. And, uh, and I, and you know, at that time, I just start hearing about people like Dean Ornish. Uh, and in fact, I'd gone up to Sausalito, California to meet Dean. And I thought about his heart program and I begged my cardiologist. I said, look, let me go to, I'll go to Sausalito. I'll stay there for two months. I'll work with Dean. And he says, no, you're on this table where you've got this blockage is dangerous and I'm not going to have you die because of what you want to do now. And so I, and so I had a balloon dilatation, a stent put in and uh, that was game changing for me. So I told him afterwards, he wanted me to take Lipitor and I made a decision. I was not going to take the drug. 
It's a statin. I wasn't going to take it. I didn't want to deal with the potential of some muscle problems, liver problems, and all that sort of stuff. I'm not telling your, your listeners or viewers not to take it. It's a decision I made. So the deal I made with him is that I told him I would come and see him every month and he could do whatever lipid profile testing, cholesterol, whatever he wanted to do every month. And I would, I would stay on a diet where I was not eating any meat, eggs or dairy, fish, anything, anything that had cholesterol I would need. It. And that was, wow, that was a long time ago. And the Forks Over Knives came out in what, 11? This had to be probably around 2009 or something like that. It's been a long time. And, and I did it. And I did it. And I want to tell your viewers that I'm going to tell you the most important thing you can do in whatever journey it is you want to go to improve your health or whatever it is, is you have to change your mind first. Okay? You can get all the recipe books and all that other stuff. But if you have it made up in your mind and in your spirit that this is something you're going to do, not for your wife, not for your husband, not for your mom, not for your dad, but for you, it doesn't matter. And I would say you've got to, you've got to internalize that because you will be the first person to throw up roadblocks to your own success if you don't do it this way. You cannot look at it from a deprivation point of view. I'm going to deprive. No, 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 no. You've got to look at this for, from the point of view is what can I do to optimally exercise those things that are going to make me the healthiest person I can be? And, you know, AJ, you've been there. You've been there. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you won't have a struggle from time to time because you've been doing something so long. It's a part of who you are. And unfortunately, the messages that you hear on the radio and on the television and the advertising that you, that you see all over the place is not designed to help you help yourself. It's designed for you to still be a victim of eating what it is that is on the, the table of America's, uh, for what we eat. And you've got to make a decision that you don't care about that. And it doesn't matter. I can go, I mean, I go out with friends I don't jump on them about what they eat. I'm only concerned about what I'm eating. And no matter where you go, especially today, which wasn't the same case, AJ, a long time ago, you can get the better places you go eat, all of them now, have a vegan or a plant-based option. And they're very, especially the high-end restaurants, they're very, very clear about that. They'll tell you in a minute, oh no, you can't have that soup, that soup, has a beef broth, or it has this, or it has that. So I am just so grateful to see the change, AJ, that we've seen happen just over in what, the last 10 years? It's been amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. I went on to do, I left, uh, I was a urologist and I got involved also in plant-based eating by looking at erectile dysfunction. Because in Dr. Esselstyn's video that you see on the Forks Over Knives movie, it shows you the role that the endothelial cells play. These are cells, if you were to take your tongue and sort of lick the inside lining of your mouth, those would be the endothelial cells that are lining all your blood vessels. And when you're eating these foods, the harmful foods that come from uh, the basically animal-based products, whether it's, it doesn't matter if beef, chicken, eggs, milk, dairy, those things attack the inside lining of your mouth and make like little pits because it's destroying those cells on the inside of your mouth. Uh, and I'm just using it as an analogy. But what happens is when the body is injured anywhere, it tries to repair itself. So the first thing it wants to do is cover that area so that the cells can get to work underneath to repair it. We call that a scab, or we call that a plaque, or we call that whatever it is that's necessary to allow that healing. But if you continue to keep hitting it and keep damaging it, all you do is you prevent that process from taking place. And eventually that thing will grow into a huge plaque 
block an artery. And to remember one other thing, this is one of the most important things you gotta remember. If you have damage to your blood vessels anywhere, you have it everywhere. I remember you saying that if you have vascular disease anywhere, you have yes. vascular disease everywhere. That's right, because you gotta remember your pipes are all connected. The blood just doesn't go to the heart or it just doesn't go to the penis or it just doesn't go to the eyes. It goes everywhere. And the same damage that's being done anywhere is being done everywhere. And so the guys in the most place where you have most of these sort of cells that are required to dilate and relate, uh, let out nitric oxide is in the penis. And so when we've been slaughtering these cells what you notice first is that you don't get your erections as hard as they used to be. And then you go from not as hard as it used to be to not being hard enough at all over time. And it is, that's what's happening. But the thing is, that's just a canary in the coal mine. Because if you're suffering from a penis that's not getting as hard as it used to, then you already have the beginnings of a heart attack with the blood vessels on the heart, a stroke with the ones that go up to the neck, vascular disease, the ones that peripheral vascular disease, they make these titles like it's different diseases, but it's not. It's all the same disease, but we're just giving it a name for where it is or where it's significant enough to cause blockage. If it's significant in your peripheral vascular system, which is where your arms and legs are, then when you walk, you start getting pain in your calves. If it's in your heart, you start getting chest pain with exercise. If it's in your blood vessels that feed your head, then you may get dizzy, you may have a stroke or, or something like that. So Dax, this is not about a fad. This is not about uh, a diet. This is about how we take care of the bodies that we've all been given by our creator and keep it in an optimal position, a physical condition. And you don't have to, you know, people say, well, you don't look that old. I'm like, well, no, and I'm not going to look that old because I'm not look, eating the stuff that makes you look old. You can turn back the clock of your life by changing the way you eat. And by the way, especially what AJ cooks, Chef AJ <laughs> is, she is an amazing, just an amazing chef. She makes some great things and I'm sure she's got all this stuff for you to go get it. I've been talking about this now on my radio show, which is heard it's in Chicago. And I've been doing it next year, AJ, it'll be 30 years. Right, so we want everybody to know that Dr. Mason has a radio show that he's had almost 30 of his 70 years and you go to iHeartRadio.com, WVON. I will type that in the chat box. I, he actually interviewed me on one episode. And, and Dr. Mason, first of all, thank you for saying I'm an amazing chef because one of my favorite meals ever was the one that I shared with you and Brian Wendell and Baxter Montgomery when you guys came to speak at one of our events. And I made a recipe that's gonna be in an upcoming book called A Date with Dessert called Frango Mint Pie because I, you're still in Chicago. I'm, I'm from Chicago and they used to have this really special candy Oh yeah, we got Marshall Fields. Fields. Right. And, and so it's not vegan, but I veganized it. So that was great. And people are loving what you're saying. Leslie's saying, I love Dr. Mason. I, I think it's so interesting how you're saying that the disease affects different parts of the body. It could be the penis. It could be the brain. It could be the, you know, the veins and the legs or the back, but it's the same disease. But what's even maybe more important is it's the same cause, the food. And the same cure, the right food. So this is, this is not anything that's miraculous. I got to say that when I was in medical school, we had 40 minutes of nutrition in four years. Four, that's one class. And doctors don't know anything about nutrition unless they learn it afterwards. And when I say nutrition, I don't mean just deficiency states. We learn about what happens when you don't have enough iron, you have iron deficiency anemia, not if you don't have enough a vitamin, certain vitamins, you have beriberi, you may have scurvy if it's vitamin C, but that's only in very extreme cases. But most of the time, people say, well, you can't get all the things you need from eating plant-based. Well, let me tell you this, you can't get any of the things that you really need eating all meat or animal-based foods because there's no fiber. And most of us, which is why I say go to your drugstore, 
and go to the laxative section of the drugstore. You will see an entire wall full of things for constipation. Why? Because we're not eating the things that would prevent the constipation, which are only plants and water. You got to drink water, not pop, not juice, not tea, not coffee. You need to drink water and you got to have vegetables because vegetables and fruits are the only things that contain fiber. You don't need to be getting something out of a bottle that you stir into some water to get your fiber. No, because it's not just the fiber, but it's also important for colonizing the right bacteria in your gut because your gut is your major source of immunity. It is your first line of defense. Why? Because if you think about it, we pick up, let's say you, you know, we were able to walk outside and get stuff we wanted to eat and we're putting that stuff in our mouth, we may or may not wash it. We don't have, if it's not full of pesticides and stuff, it's not a big deal. You know why? Because our gut will neutralize all the things that are in nature that might cause us a problem. We don't have to worry about it. I'm not saying don't wash your fruits or anything like that, but if you're eating organically grown places and in one of the farms that I work with now, the, it's all, the, the water is natural, there's no, no pesticides, there's none of that. Right? And we're trying to now actually in the middle of raising some more money because I want it to grow from where it is now to almost a hundred acres. So we could have this kind of food that's pesticide free, that it's watered from an aquifer that goes down almost a hundred feet. It's naturally filtered water. I mean, it's, it, and the, the vegetables are amazing that come out of this place but you do the best you can where you are and get the best vegetables and the best fruit that you possibly can get. And also drink your water because that combination of that fiber from those plants that come from the leaves, the good thing about plants is you don't really have to cook them. You really don't. I mean, they're designed to be eaten. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. They're designed, they're designed to be eaten uh, absolutely in a natural state. And uh, I have to, I'm just going to cancel that call right quick. And, uh, and what we need to do is, is eat as many of them as possible in their natural state. So when we get an apple, we should be eating the apple. When we get the orange, you know, I don't want you to eat the peel, but at least just peel the orange and eat it. Um, and many of our beans, we, not beans, but our like green beans, string beans, uh, they don't have to be cooked till they're just like lip. They can be still made and you're the expert there in terms of how you do that. So I'm gonna stop right here. I don't know if we have any questions, but I'd yeah. love to see questions. There is a question first, a comment from Leslie who says she loved you before. She saw someone at the grocery store with a basket of white bread, Pop-Tarts, chips, Coke, and two tubes of Preparation H. Sounds like a perfect combination. It's exactly why she needs a preparation age. Yeah, I, I yeah. do have a, I have a question from Nirvana about when you went whole food plant-based, but I also have a question from myself because I'm just so curious how you were discovered for the movie of Forks Over Knives. Well, this is interesting. I went, um, when I was a urologist, one day I just decided I couldn't do it anymore. I was a very successful, very busy urologist. I was doing more penile implant surgeons than most. We had a large injection program where we were teaching men to inject their penis with a drug in order to make it uh, erect. It was amazing, but you know, something spoke to me and I believe it was the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're not helping these people. You're, you're, we're just creating a Band-Aid and I couldn't do it anymore. So I went to see a good friend of mine who has a vegan restaurant, met him over there. And I said, you know, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it anymore. Because I was good at taking pieces out of people. I could take prostates out and bladders out and kidneys out. Uh, I could do penile implant surgery where we put in silicone devices filled with liquid. So in a, a pump deflate valve in their scrotum so they could pump up their penis and it would stay hard as long as they wanted it to. But I, I, that wasn't really where my spirit was. 
So when I told him that I couldn't do this anymore, he suggested to me that I go to Israel and take a spiritual journey and just allow whatever spoke to me to speak to me and make a decision then. So that's what I did. I went to Israel and I went all over Israel. I went to every, I mean, went to all the normal places. I just floated in the Dead Sea or what they call the Sea of Life over there. I, I went to Jerusalem, I went to Beersheba, I went to Old Jerusalem, I was at the Wailing Wall, I went to all of those places and saw the intersection of all of the major religions of the world. And it was a life-changing experience for me. And when I came back, I had an offer from the city of Chicago to come and be its commissioner of the Department of Public Health. I didn't even know what public health was. And, uh, and I went to make a long story short, I, I, I was like, what in the hell am I doing? But I felt compelled that I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to get caught up in the political craziness. But to make a long story short, I took the job. And I'll tell you, I went to the job and I had no background in public health, zero. And I told my staff, I had a staff of about 1600 people because we were responsible for about 2.4 million residents. And I said to the staff, I know you've all Googled me and you know, I don't know anything about public health. So let's just get that out the way. But I told him, I said, I'm smart. And I think you guys are some of the brightest people I've ever met. And if you're willing to teach me, I'll be willing to learn. And AJ, I went and I, and when I say learn, I went out with our food inspectors. I crawled around on the floor with a flashlight looking for rodents. I opened up the contain the uh, refrigerators with my thermometer and was checking the temperatures of all. And you as a chef know exactly what I'm talking about because cold foods have to be kept 40 degrees or colder and hot foods have to be kept 140 degrees or hotter. And what we did, we went to some major chain restaurants and when we found things that weren't what they needed to be, our, we poured bleach in it and we had them throw it all out. I went out with, uh, with my uh, people that were looking for West Nile virus. We set mosquito traps all over the city looking for certain mosquitoes. I learned more about the mating habits of mosquitoes. I learned how to look at uh, different mosquitoes to understand which ones were the ones that carried West Nile and which ones did it. I became the emergency preparedness guy. I mean, I just had amazing people. And then what I did was I let them, I gave them more latitude to do more stuff because I could see that these were amazing people with amazing talent that had been curtailed. And so some of the people that I worked with there went on to work at the CDC or they worked at other, nat they took national level jobs. And that was wonderful. That was wonderful. And I think as a leader, it's my job to help inspire and help bring the best I can out of people. And that's what you do. That's what you're doing on this show. This is not about beating the people overhead about plant-based eating. This is about showing you if you wanna live your best possible life and, and, and hopefully get rid of some of your medications, not all at once, but over time, you, diabetes, you can make go away, AJ. Type two diabetes, you can make it go away. We know that type two diabetes has nothing to do with sugar. It has to do with saturated fats. What's a saturated fat? Any fat that's solid at room temperature is a saturated fat. So, and those things that we're eating, we don't have a food supply problem in America. What we're calling food is really not food. It is a food product. And if you want food, you got to go back to the earth and get that. And you've got to take what you've learned how to do. You don't have to boil something two hours in order to eat it. Uh, and then when we're using the meats and we're frying these things at high temperatures, it's not me that said this, but the International Agency on Cancer Research, the IACR said that two, I'm sorry, said that one hot dog or four strips of bacon 
increase your colorectal cancer risk by 18%. That's not me. That's what the agents that looked at over 800 papers that talked about this. Processed meats are, 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 are killing us. What's a processed meat? If it don't look like that when it comes from the animal, it's processed. And people say they eat turkey bacon. Turkey bacon is more processed than pork bacon because there's no anatomical part of the turkey you can slice and get bacon. So that I want everybody that's listening, I want you to go look at turkey bacon, how they make turkey bacon. When you at least eat pork bacon, and I'm not suggesting you do that either, but when you eat pork bacon, you're eating the belly, the skin of the belly of the pig. And the, the, that's why you see hair sometimes on it. They take it all out. But when you're slicing it, you're slicing through the skin of the pork belly, um, of the, the, the stomach lining, the stomach of the pig. And that fat is all the fat that we have around our waist. And then what little muscle tissue you see are the little muscle fibers. So when you're slicing, you, you have to smoke it, cure it, do all these things that help to dehydrate and all that other stuff. And it has to be salted. And that process is what we use. And when you're slicing, that bacon, you're slicing the skin of that pork, the belly and that underskin. But on the turkey, there's no belly to slice. There's nowhere to get that. So you have to, there's an extrusion process where they make this thing look like bacon and they flavor it so it gets the flavor of bacon, but it's not anatomically correct. And it's no, it's not natural at all. That's amazing. I love how you say, if you want food, you have to go back to the earth to get it. That's brilliant. Let me read a couple comments, Dr. Mason. Janet says, Dr. Mason is why I'm vegan. He spoke in Tinley Park, Illinois at the Ingalls Hospital Women's Forum, October of 2016. And he convinced me to change to whole food plant-based that day. Love what he says and how he says it. So uh, Susan says that she had TAVR and three stents is there still hope she is a partial cheating vegan? And then we have another question of kidney disease. Beverly says, can kidney disease be reversed? Well, it depends on how bad it's gotten. So that same process that was damaging the blood cells in the penis is damaging the blood cells in the kidney. Think of your killed kidney having millions of little filter units, filtering units in it. And when those little filtering units are small, tiny blood vessels. So when we eat something other than a whole food plant-based diet, we are damaging those filtering units. And when you damage enough of them, they won't do what they need to do anyway, anymore. Now, Dr. Baxter Montgomery uh, has some things that he's done looking at how that might be reversed. And depending upon how bad it is, you know, I can't say that you'll reverse it 100%, but Dr. Montgomery in Houston, Texas is someone I would refer her to. I don't see patients at all. I don't do any therapeutics at all. I, I just really encourage people to just eat plant-based. And you know, people say, well, I don't know how to do that. Yeah, you do. It's called YouTube. It's called Google. It's called reading H Chef AJ's book. It's called, you know, we learn how to do anything we want to do. And we can, that's wrong and of right. So I don't buy it today with all of the YouTubes, all of the videos, including yours, Chef AJ, there is enough information that if you really want to do this, you can find out how to do it. If I told you, if I gave you an obscure URL with only like three of the nine letters you needed, but I would tell you that if you went there, there's a million dollars you can claim, you figure it out, you figure it out. So I'm saying, I don't want to hear excuses about people. Now I know their circumstances and, and you know people, but can't is not a word I want to hear because everybody can. The question is, will you? And and you start, you start, you get in where you fit in. You know, I people rarely make total 180 degree changes at once. But if you can, that's fine. But if not, just start eating more. I just say eat more add more vegetables and fruits to whatever it is you're eating. Just keep adding more. And then you crowd out that plate. And people say, well, what about your protein? Well, none of the animals you eat 
for protein, you don't ask them where they got their protein. Because if you did, you saw cow eating, although our, our commercialized farming now has destroyed, the, destroyed in many instances what these animals eat naturally. But when a cow is eating naturally, and I mean naturally, not a diet of soy and corn, but when they're grazing in the fields, they're eating grass and they're eating clover and they're eating all of those things. And many people, your videos, Milton Moore's videos, Mike Gregor's videos, there's a lot of stuff out there that says, all you have to, every, that you can get all of the essential amino acids from plant-based eating. You gotta eat a wide cornucopia of them. You won't get it, get it from eating one thing. But guess what? What you're doing when you're eating, and I tell the men all the time, all the manliest places you are supposed to go and eat, all the manliest foods, the steaks and the sausages and the bratwurst and all those things will rob you of your manhood. Those are the things that are damaging the cells in your penis that will not make you able to have a good, firm, long-lasting erection. You won't be able to have an erection that you can put your shirt on the end of and walk around in the house without it falling off. Now, I know that's rather graphic, but it makes the point. And that's what we used and can do. We can do that. The other things that I, not only just eating plant-based, but you got to get sleep and you got to manage your stress. So eating, and that means that you got to change your mental and spiritual diet along with your physical diet. It all goes together as a triad. And I'm not saying you become a religious fanatic or anything like that, but it's how do you communicate with your, and that's what prayer is. Prayer is your internal communication to the spirit that allows you to look beyond who you are, understand whose you are to become the person you need to be. That's beautiful. William says, thank you, my brother. And uh, the, the lady that asked the question about the kidney disease, she said stage three, but I will tell you that I had somebody do my program that was stage four and she, she, she recovered. Of course, you know, results can vary depending on compliance and things like that. And let's see, as far as Baxter Montgomery, absolutely great suggestion. He is going to be a guest as soon as he gets back to me. I just spoke to him yesterday. And somebody mentioned a study. I don't know if you heard of this, Dr. Mason. Marie says, Dr. Wassler of John Hopkins published a vegan study to reverse kidney disease, the 12 steps to avoid dialysis. Are you familiar with that? Not, not that one in particular, but I'll look it up. Yeah, if, if you can provide a link to it, I will get it to Dr. Mason as soon as possible. You know, a, a lot of people have been saying with this, this coronavirus that it's an equalizer, but it's not an equalizer because it's pretty unfair. You, you were talking to me before we came on as to the percentage of people in the African-American community that are getting it. Could you please address that? Because I think it's really important. Yeah, let me just, <clears throat> let me just say that what COVID-19 did was exposed the horrible underbelly of many of our cities where we've had years, if not centuries or half centuries of neglect of people who were less fortunate. And what happens is our food system has also taken advantage of people who are poor because the, why is it that we have to pay more for good food? And why is it that bad food is so cheap? And it's so cheap because it's heavily subsidized by our government. And our government could switch. The, why don't, if we really wanted people to be healthy, why can't we switch it and make the good foods cheap to eat because of the subsidies and the bad foods more expensive? So the bad foods are all these processed foods that we've been talking about. And even some of our good foods are still felt relatively cheap. And you could speak to this better than I can, but beans are still relatively cheap. Beans, peas, rice, those things are still relatively cheap. But when we go and we look at the things that are, it's not just being cheap, it's being widely available. So you can walk and go to, in many of these communities, you could get to a chicken place or a pizza place, 
or a sandwich place or burger place much easier and get service and get in and out much faster than you can with looking at buying raw fruits and vegetables. Why? Because first of all, our society has compressed our time so much and made us feel that we had to be so busy, I don't know doing what, but so busy that we don't have time to cook. And Chef AJ, you need to watch what she talks, what she can do with an Instapot. And when you use a pressure cooker, and I have mine over there, all of a sudden time is not an issue anymore. You can put stuff in, if you wanna put it in in a slow cooker overnight, or even if you don't, that stuff you put, I mean, I've taken collard greens and string beans, and I'm talking about minutes, it's done. 10 minutes and it may be overdone, depending on what it is you're cooking. So we have to stop finding miserable excuses for why we don't do the right thing. And, and this is not about, well, you know, I've been eating this way. Well, can, if that's what you want to do, continue doing it. And you'll keep getting what you got. But if you want to get something different, you got to do something different. And I'm telling you, you know, as, I, as, as Chef AJ said, I'll be 70 years old next year. And I feel, abs I don't feel there's anything that I couldn't do. I feel, I feel absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I was, at one time I was up to almost four to five blood pressure medications. Right now I just take one and I'm working on getting rid of that one. Uh, but we don't have to be, we don't, I mean, at pharmacy, you talk about spending money. Look at how much money you got to spend on drugs these days, even generics. It is unconscionable what we have to do. And a lot of the things that we're taking medicines for, we can certainly, by switching to a whole food plant-based diet, if you don't get rid of it completely, you can get rid of 80% of it, um, depending on what the disease is. I was, I was with Dr. Galdener, bye-bye uh, lupus or goodbye lupus. Uh, she, you know, she treated her lupus and, her, and she's helping to treat other people with Sorgen syndrome. Uh, and other people with these connective tissue disorders on, with diet alone. And they told her she'd never be able to have a baby. And she has, I think, one or two. So I think that we were so heavily marketed. I mean, you think about it. You turn on your TV to watch a television program. Your TV program comes on at 8 o'clock. The other one went off at 8 o'clock. So between 7.53 and 8 o'clock, you had to watch commercials. And between 8 o'clock and about 8.07, you were watching more commercials. And what are those mostly commercials about? If it isn't about a lawyer, it's about food. And if it's about food, it's about fast foods. And nowadays, when well, we've got these 60-inch television sets, you lay down and you have an insomniac minute at night, you turn on TV, and now you've got a 60-inch hamburger that has been enhanced to look overly appetizing. And because now all you gotta do is reach over for your cell phone and you can dial and have it delivered. So you gotta understand that people are doing that because everybody is making money on that chain and you're losing it. And you're not only doing that, but you're taking seconds off your, light, your, your life clock, seconds and minutes off of your light clock with every bite of that food that you just ordered. So what we've got to do, AJ, is to figure out a way to get good, whole food, plant-based foods available, quick, cheap, and get it delivered to folks. Right. You know, it's not just COVID that the African, that, like Cersei's question is, what can we do to bridge the gap with African-Americans having the highest rate of COVID, what are your suggestions to reach that community? But they also have high rates of high blood pressure and diabetes and, and heart disease too, It's right? Yeah, well, what I'm saying is that when we, I just finished, I was just on a call with South Africa as they're getting ready. Um, but the issues about what we're seeing, uh, these issues have to do with the three major things that guide someone's health. It's where you work, where you live, and where you play. That determines when you die. So in Chicago, between one part of the city and another part of the city, the life expectancy is 90 years old in that one part of the city. And in the same city, not that far away on, on, a, on a train ride, 
the life expectancy drops 30 years. Why? Because if you look at those communities, you look at how they're resourced for grocery stores, or if they're any grocery stores, many places have to eat out of what we call corner stores, where they may not even have fresh fruits and vegetables. Also, you have unemployment or you have underemployment, people who are not able to make the kind of wage to pay the rent and then make sure that they have enough money to spend for better foods. So they, what do they do? They go to the stores that are in those communities where they're more likely to buy what they can afford, which is not a good food. Number, the other thing is we are a generation that does not know how to cook. My mama was, I'm one of 10 kids. My mother always had a pot of beans, some rice on the stove, and we gotten away from that. We need to eat more beans and greens than we do to some of this other stuff. And oftentimes there may be single moms who are working and then they've got to come home and they got to do, try and get through homework and all the other sort of stuff. So what do they do? Because we've made bad food cheap and widely available and easy to get. We can drive through, we can walk through, we can do whatever we need to do to get the bad food. You don't have to stand over the stove, you don't have to cook, you don't have to go to the store, you don't have to bring it home, you don't. That's one of the things that makes it. And so in the African-American communities and the Hispanic communities and in lower income white communities, what you see because of this is more diabetes, more hypertension, more obesity, more so-called heart disease, more strokes because of the foods that people are eating and the stressors on their life that create problems. Just, am I feeling safe taking the, the, the public transportation to and from work? Those stressors, all of which have a physiologic manifestation in the body. So what COVID-19 is doing in those communities, it's it's amplifying the impact of those sorts of conditions that have existed in many of these uh, communities for decades. And so the housing situations, I mean, you've got kids that because there may be a pesticide problem that are spraying for different roaches or ants or whatever it may be. And then these kids are inhaling it. And these kids, some of these kids and some of the adults have asthma. The landlords aren't as attentive. We've got still housing stock built before 1978 in the city of Chicago that's painted with lead-based paint. I mean, there are any number of things that are creating. It's not the people, it's the systems that created the conditions where the people live. And what COVID did was expose that ugly underbelly of what happens to poor people or people who are not as advantaged as other people. That's what it is. And so when people have underlying conditions like asthma or hypertension or so-called heart disease or obese, so-called obesity, uh, when you just think about it, if a person is very obese, when they lay down, what happens? Well, their whole, all that abdominal fat goes up against their diaphragm and the lung can't expand. And if you've got a disease like COVID-19, which attacks the very cells in the lung and begins to incapacitate them from doing their job of exchanging carbon dioxide and oxygen, what do you expect to happen? Or in these communities, there may not be quality hospitals like many of our major teaching institutions. There may be just a very small hospital without the kind of expertise that's needed. So when people who are working or people who are trying to balance paying the rent and they go to work sick, because that's what they have to do. This is what creates the tsunami that we're seeing. And on, in South Africa and in many of these poor countries, I expect there to be a tidal wave of death in these countries because of this amplification of this particular problem. Oh boy, you know, uh, we're getting comments like from 
Sherry, the good doctor is extremely persuasive, would love to see him teaching on a mass scale. And so would I, now maybe that you're retired from your very busy job as a chief operating officer, whatever you were called in Cook County Medical, uh, you could have some more time to do these interviews because people are, are really, really loving you. You know, one of the things I noticed is I, in 2008, when I started speaking professionally, I did a lot of talks at churches. And this organization called Black Women's Wellness invited me to their church to do a cooking demo for the ladies, many of them who were overweight and had diabetes. And they, they, they liked the food. And there was a part where there was a children's ministry there at the same time. And so the kids came in. Now, this is interesting. The kids hated the food. And we're going to be talking to some doctors this weekend. I do these lives every day, like Sabatino and Goldhammer, the fasting doctors who talks about this concept called taste neuroadaptation. But I find that some of the people that are overweight and obese now, they at least had the benefit at some point in their life of being introduced to fruits and vegetables, and then they got into the junk. But when these kids are being raised just with the junk, it's very difficult. So like we made this, like they wouldn't eat any of the fruits and vegetables. They had one thing they would take and I made a smoothie with spinach, but when I put cocoa powder in it and in dates where they couldn't see the spinach, they would drink it, but they were, they were so adverse to any healthy food. Because they haven't seen it. They haven't seen it. They don't know what it tastes like. And many of their places where they live, they, it's not, they've not been exposed to it. It's so easy to run and get a bag of fries and a burger or something like that, or to get, I mean, we have kids that in the city of Chicago that their breakfast was flaming hots and coke. I mean, and then we, when I was, even when I was going to school uh, a long, long time ago in grammar school, we, they had the, all of the, the sweets. You had long johns and you had donuts and you had, you know, you had all this stuff. And then you're supposed to go and sit still in your seat after being, given this sh all this sugar, it doesn't make sense. So, and, and what happens is if you look at what they market to kids, it's all candy. All the cereals, they're all sugar coated. I mean, there's, there's not, I, I grew up eating farina. I don't even know if your audience knows what farina is, but uh, cream of wheat, malto meal. I mean, a lot of these uh, grits, um, a lot of these things that, you, that didn't take a long time to prepare, but let me just say this real quick. We introduced a concept at the APHA meeting called appetite deserts. And what is an appetite desert? When you've grown up in a house where you've never really eaten fruits and vegetables very much, you don't develop a taste for it. And even if you put a store in the community that sells it, if I don't have an appetite for that food, I won't go look for it. And we've seen stores like that close because they're, they're in these food deserts, they became appetite deserts because people did not know what they had lots of spoilage of vegetables and what have you, because they had not been made acquaint, acquainted with vegetables. I grew up green eating greens and beans and turnip bottoms and all that kind of stuff. So I grew up with that as something that was part of my taste of Taste index. I was that's I, I crave those foods because I remember eating them as a child. You got children nowadays that have never eaten that stuff. That everything they've eaten has come out of some kind of fast food joint, where they're getting X number of chicken wings, or they're getting uh, spare ribs, or they're getting hot dogs, or tacos, or or whatever it is. They don't even know. I had to when my child I was grew up and I was divorced. I had took my children. And even wherever we went to eat, they had to get up, get out of the car, come into the place, sit down. And we had a meal. Most of these kids now are eating, the car has become a dining room because kids, people are eating in the car. They don't even take the time to get out the car to go inside, even to eat a burger. So our children are being acculturated to this sort of eating on the go, walking down the street, doing those sorts of things, AJ. So that they don't, they're not being acculturated to being able to have healthy habits. Are you familiar with Ron Finley? I think he's called the renegade gardener where he said there are more deaths caused by the drive through than by the drive by. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. It's absolutely true. And that's why you see the tsunamis, the tsunami of death because many of these people in these communities are eating out of these drive throughs 
and they're ending up with, I mean, diabetes. So diabetes already attacks all your small blood vessels, as we talked about earlier. If you add insult to that by eating more of these other kinds of foods, what do you think? I mean, if you drive through the black community, you'll see more dialysis centers than anything else. And, and if you go into those dialysis centers, you know, you go see sitting on it in there, you're gonna see black men, lots of black men on these dialysis, in these dialysis centers. And they're all over the black community. Why? Because we have renal failure. And, and obviously with the dialysis center, yeah, you need to get dialyzed, but it's also, you know, you can make a dollar or two with the dialysis center. So there are so many things and there's nothing wrong with black people, which is why we end up with COVID more than, and die more from it. What's wrong is the stuff that, we, that has happened to us by where we live, the food choices that we have, and unfortunately the food choices that we make, which is also oftentimes based on what you have. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they did a study looking at some places in California and when they looked at these two different communities that were otherwise similar, other than one was by a railroad track, didn't have good food, grocery stores and what have you. And when they did the data, this is in a study looking at food deserts and actually it's the forward, I can get you the reference, but there was a 70% chance of dying, 70% higher chance of dying in one community versus the other community. And they were both in California but one was more resource, the other one was, was not. So, and, 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 and if, it's, if it stays resource poor long enough, the people will never know what it, what it is they really need to eat. Wow, uh, Darius is saying, preach it, Dr. Mason. I could listen to you all day. God, maybe you will have a, a pulpit one day that we can <laughs> listen to you from. You mentioned you're one of 10 children. Do any of your siblings eat this way? Were you able to in influence either family members or patients or, or maybe even the mayor of Chicago? Well, in the, the, for the mayor, we did a year, we did a thing every year coming out of what I call the season of gluttony, which begins on Thanksgiving day and goes all the way to New Year's. So we asked them to be plant-based for 30 days from January 2nd through January 31st. And so we're still trying to do that uh, just to introduce people. We meet at some of the, what I call transitional restaurants. These are restaurants that are vegan, but they try to emulate some of the tastes and textures that people are accustomed to. Um, and, and so that's what we try to do. My family, uh, my, I have, uh, one brother who's and his wife who is trying to get there and all of them now with the exception of maybe a couple are eating far more vegetables than they used to and when they come over I don't beat people I, I tell people do not do that do not beat people over the head all you're going to do is chase them away but ask them to try some I made some vegetarian I made some chili and and they and I put the vegetarian crumbles in it chef AJ and they all thought it was turkey chili. They all thought it. And I'm like, nope, it's not. And I actually had some, um, some of this, the, 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 the vegetarian or the, the, the vegan kind of little Polishes. And I cut those and put those in there too. And, and it, I call it good transition food. I'm not talking about real Polish. There was no actual meat, but I call it good transition food. And you can emulate those tastes and as best you can those textures, it'll go a, a way to get people doing a much better job. You know, just, you know, by just beating people over the head, that doesn't work. And it chases people away. Right, changing a bite at a time. Did you see the movie Game Changers and what did you think of the famous scene? Uh, I thought Game Changers was a game changer. I mean, that movie, if anybody still thinks that you can't be strong, that you can't be fast, that you can't be agile, that you can't do certain things without eating tons and tons of meat, you need to watch Game Changers. Um, and, and, oh, I'm sorry, there's my well, It's such a popular guy, I can... I... Yeah, I'll, I'll call him back. Um, what we have to do is understand that if you have any of those doubts, watch that movie. And for the guys with their erections, 
watch that movie because there's a scene in there, a part in there where they actually show the difference between both the strength and the frequency and duration of erections based on the foods that you eat. And there's one guy that walks over a thousand miles who's plant-based. So the myth has been destroyed. If you, if you think the myth is still there that you gotta eat meat, you're wrong. And watch Game Changers. And you'll see it'll be a game changer for you. The little part that I had in the movie was really trying to get people to understand that the food industry is gonna be doing the same thing the tobacco industry did. The tobacco industry knew 50 years before they had to finally admit it that cigarette smoking caused to, uh, cancer, lung cancer. The food industry is doing the same thing now, trying to confuse us enough to not understand the role of what we're eating and diabetes and heart attacks and strokes and, and kidney disease and hypertension, all of those things. And so they're using the playbook from the tobacco industry to use their own science tests that they pay to create just enough doubt or confusion. That's the tactic. And there's a great paper by Kelly Brownell from the University of Michigan that talks about uh, this and, and really goes into depth on understanding how they're using the playbook. And what they want to do is create just enough doubt in your mind by getting their scientists to say, oh no, you should drink milk. And I always say cow milk is the absolute perfect food for baby calves. That's what it's for. There's no reason at all that any human should be drinking milk other than from its mother's breast when that's the appropriate thing for that child to do. After that, you don't need it at all. You can get everything, all the calcium, you can get all the, and, and it's full of insulin growth factor one, which actually aggravates and makes, you know, you think about insulin growth factor, it's a substance that makes cells grow and makes them grow large. Why? Because you got a 65 pound calf that ends up having to be a 400 pound cow. So those cells, those muscle cells have to grow, bone cells have to grow. But if you're an adult, you're not growing anymore and you're certainly not growing like a cow. So what are you still eating that stuff, drinking that stuff for? It's not because you need it. It's because you've been told to believe that you need it, but you don't. So, you know, I, I, that's all I say. If you want to continue to drink it, that's on you. But now that you know better, you can't blame me if something bad happens. Right. Terrific. We have time for one more question, Dr. Mason. I know you make phone calls the whole time, but you're welcome to come back as often as you like. Oh, so, we're past time. Yeah, well, so I just, I want to respect your time. Uh, okay, go ahead. But we can go longer if you like. Dina says, you talk about erectile dysfunction in men, but can that be the same in women who have lost their libido? So is there a female version of erectile dysfunction? Sure. It's called clitoral engorgement. To the extent that an enlarged or engorged clitoris is important for female orgasm, because you got to remember, the woman's clitoris, I know it's going to sound really crazy, but it's true. <laughs> it's actually made of the same erectile bodies as the man's penis, just a lot smaller. So for the clitoris to be engorged, and to the extent that's necessary for pleasure for the woman and helping her to reach orgasm, then the same problem exists for her and having problems with clitoral, clitoral engorgement as a man does with penile enlargement. Well, that's great. Any, any last thoughts or words, any hope for this situation? Well, there's always hope. There's always hope when we look for help. And the help we need is, has it come from within? And it has to come from people like you, Chef AJ who put the blueprints out there for people who want to do better to do better. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all in your hand. You won't do anything you don't want to do and you'll do everything that you want to do. So what I want you to do is I want you to choose life. I want you to choose health. I want you to choose creating the body that God gave us to be the temples of his Holy Spirit. And you can't do that with a justified body. You can't have that welcome. You can't have 
the spirit of God, welcome, or whatever you believe in terms of a higher being. You can't have that inhabit a pesticide filled, um, a negative thought producing, a toxin, toxin containing uh, temple. It won't work. So if there's anything, continue listening to what Chef AJ says, follow those references, learn how to eat life. Stop eating dead things. Eat life to have it more abundantly. Thank you. Well said. Thank you so much for spending this time with us, Dr. Mason. Thank you all for watching. I hope you guys come back in an hour when I'm interviewing another medical doctor who actually has breast cancer. And even though she had a clear mammogram, so you'll want to stay tuned for that story. I could talk to you all day, Dr. Mason. I hope I get to see you in person at another time because I've been doing so many events traveling for 12 years and the ones that I always had the most fun at were the ones with you, especially you and Dr. Baxter Montgomery and Chef Babette, those times in the car oh with Dr. Lyle. Oh, I, of all, like if I ever wrote a memoir. We won't talk about those times. <laughs> not, 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 but, but if I think about all the fun I've had, even with oh, cruises yeah. and everything, those were my funnest moments with you in the, in the limo with Dr. Lyle. We can't really say what happened, but it was hilarious. And <laughs> it was hilarious. Remember. But isn't laughter a wonderful thing, Chef AJ? You know what I call laughter? I call laughter the dessert of life. You need a pulpit. I'm I'm not kidding. Because if you're not going to be a doctor, then be a preacher. Because you know you you have inspired all of us. Well, I thank God. It wasn't me that did it. It was the words that the Spirit gave to me to say to you. So right. I'm just so grateful for this opportunity, Chef AJ. Oh. And when I get my act together, now that I have some time to start putting shows together, then we'll be we'll be interviewing each other. Well, if I can help you in any way, I'd, I'd love to. And now you can finally write that book that's been inside you for so long. I've got two of them sitting here, both half done. Okay. Well, put them together and you got one book. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I will. Thank you so much, Chef AJ. Thank you, Dr. Mason. And, and thanks everyone. And you and all your followers and listeners. Thank you for the work that you've done and you're going to continue to do. Thank you for inspiring us. Thank you for looking the part that you talk about. So I can't say enough. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for watching. And please subscribe to the YouTube channel and please share these interviews. Take care. And thanks again, Dr. Mason. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Bye.